started. Okay. Hello, everyone, and thanks for tuning in this morning for Niall's Voice of Business. This live stream will feature interviews with local business owners, professionals, and village representatives to provide resources and insights for the businesses of Niles. Today, we have the distinct privilege of having Senator Ron Villavalam join us. Senator, first, I'd like to thank you for your partnership. You and your staff have been amazing during the pandemic. You have kept our chamber informed and up to date. And beyond that, you have gone, gone above and beyond in advocating for our business owners. We truly appreciate that. So thank you. Um, all right. I'm just going to kind of jump in with our questions. Uh, few events in history have been as challenging as the COVID-19 pandemic. And as Illinois slowly recovers from the economic devastation caused by the pandemic, how have you been assisting and supporting working families, small businesses, and communities who have been hit hard? Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, first uh, and foremost, good morning. Uh, and, and thank you, Alicia and Chase, uh, for having me on. And uh, more importantly, thank you for the work that you've done to support our small businesses in the village of Niles and in the surrounding area. It's because of organizations like yourself that we've been able to weather this storm. And it's been a true honor for me to work with you all uh, to make sure that uh, our residents, our constituents, our small business owners are getting accurate information. And we're also hearing from them as to what needs to happen and what needs to uh, happen next, what needs to happen during the pandemic and so forth. Uh, and so you all have been a true uh, partner and ally, and I appreciate that. And we should all be thanking you for, for your contributions to the community. It certainly has been an unprecedented time. Uh, I don't even think unprecedented, you know, as much, as much as a word that is, I don't think it fully describes uh, the situation that that we've been in, it, it's the last few months have been incredibly trying, and I I describe my job in three different quote unquote buckets. Uh, one is legislation, as as all, many of you know, all of you know, January through the end of May is our legislative session in Springfield, uh, and uh, that's really when we um, pass uh, bills and make you know do our fundamental responsibility in terms of making a budget uh, and so forth. And then we have veto session in November and so and, and kind of take up uh, items that to follow up what we did in, in the spring. Uh, and, and obviously that got curtailed a little bit uh, this uh, this year uh, with the pandemic. Um, I also uh, do outreach. Right. I, I the way I learn of what legislation to introduce and what my office should be focused on is by having conversations like this and uh, quite honestly, you know, yeah, doing them across the board, nonprofits, schools, businesses, uh, you name it. I've, I've been trying to be out there and, and talk to folks. Obviously, I haven't been able to do that physically. Um, and so um, at, at the risk of uh, reminding everyone that we've we've been on a, a Zoom fix here, uh, we, uh, we, we really have um, try to maintain that outreach and, and, and do as much as we can, given the circumstances. The last part, though, is, is relates to your question, which is constituent services. And I would say there's probably a, a, a typically a, 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 a good equal split between the three responsibilities that I have. And just to back up a second, I represent 217,000 people, uh, 21 neighborhoods in the city of Chicago, from Albany Park to West Rogers Park, and uh, six suburbs in Cook County, Lincolnwood, Skokie, Niles, Morton Grove, Glenview, and Unincorporated Displains. And um, it's been a challenge because uh, we obviously have a lot of people uh, hurting and um, and constituent service has absolutely taken um, uh, our office and and, and to, to the brink to the capacity um, of, of what we do. Uh, and so that's been our focal point. Uh, we've reached out uh, in terms of outreach. What I've tried to do is uh, make sure people have accurate information and make sure we're getting them the resources that they need. Uh, and so the first step of that is outreach. So we did a, a robocall to everybody in the district. We did text messaging. We did a mailer in seven different languages. Uh, we're, we're doing, we were doing calls to seniors uh, to make to do checks on, on, on their health because uh, they're a more at-risk population. Uh, and uh, we've been able to help people with unemployment, small business assistance, medication delivery, food delivery, uh, and, and so forth, utility bill relief. Uh, and so we've really tried to step up our, uh, our constituent services to at least make sure people have the accurate information of what's taking place. As you all know, this the information is changing every day, you know, and, and, and it's hard because this is something that we've never dealt with uh, right. before. 
And, and so we want to make sure people um, have, have that accurate information and then follow it up with the resources that they need. Uh, and so that's something that we've tried to focus on as well. And I'll just point out that it's been great to, again, partner with you all. We've been able to host uh, two webinars for small businesses uh, right. in addition to the conversations that we've had. Um, and there's just a lot of information out there. So I'll stop there. But um, yeah, no, it's it's you're right. It's 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 hard to keep up with all of it. And you guys have done a great job. Um, can you tell us about the COVID-19 budget that provided extra support for working families and small businesses? Uh, Senate Bill 264. Absolutely. So, look, this is this is our budget. This is our most fundamental responsibility um, as a, as a legislature and as a state uh, government. And I'll back up a second and say it's going to be hard for people to believe this. I don't blame you if you don't believe it. We were actually headed towards a small, small surplus this year um, before the pandemic, and you know it really was the result of making tough decisions in uh, last year in 2019. And I'll also back up and say I'm part of a class of legislators. 30% of the legislator legislature is new within the last two years, and so I think our class really, you know, said, "Look, we're not going to Springfield to to maintain business as usual. We want to." roll up our sleeves and make the tough decisions to get things done, you know, and, and that's the bottom line. We need to turn our state around after, you know, 20 years, 30 years of fiscal mismanagement uh, where we didn't make our pension payment, rising property taxes. And um, the fact that we had a two year, six day budget impasse um, uh, from 2015 to 2017, uh, we, we had to step up, you know, and I think that's what we did last year. We made some tough choices, tough decisions, uh, and we ended up with a small surplus. Uh, however, you know, that was completely negated by the pandemic. And, right. you know, people can look at this budget that we passed and say, well, it's, it's not, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're counting on revenues that are only potential and not actual. And the way, my response to them is it's about one responsibility and two stability and certainty for our residents and our businesses. So we could have said, there's a $7 billion deficit in our budget, four to $7 billion. And, you know, we're going to cut four to $7 billion. If that, if that were to happen, there would be no housing, uh, rental, rental and or mortgage assistance. There'd be no, un, there'd be no, it would be harder to um, provide unemployment insurance assistance. There would be no small business assistance, business through disruption grants and so forth. And so we looked at this and said, look, we know that the federal government is going to have to act and, and, and provide another package of, of, of assistance to federal and state governments. We also know that there's a, an impending decision by voters in the state of Illinois regarding the graduated income tax um, in, in, in November. And so and we, we were in special session for, for five days due to the safety of our staff and advocates. You know, hundreds and hundreds of advocates usually come down every day to Springfield, but we didn't want to put people at risk. And so in that five days, we said, let's pass a budget that provides some certainty and stability for small businesses, for working, for, for unemployed folks, for people that are uh, in need of assistance. And we'll know in no, by November, but by the time of our veto session, and well before the, the end of the fiscal year, um, if we're going to be able to um, have that assistance from the federal government if the graduated income tax passes and so forth. And then at that point, we're going to have to make a decision. We're going to have to make a decision and it's going to be tough, but we'll have to make a decision. But in the meantime, we did not want to put our businesses, our residents in a situation where they were not able to get assistance because we had to cut four to $7 billion due to the pandemic. Okay. Um, and I'll just so, note, Alicia, sorry, I'll just note, it's important to note that we had to make make sure that we funded education as our number one responsibility in the budget. We put $600 million of assistance for small businesses. We, we put an additional uh, $600 million towards the Illinois Department of Public Health. We got to remember that our public health departments and our healthcare system was not prepared for a pandemic. This hasn't happened in a hundred years. And so, to, so we had to put additional funding towards that to make sure the testing, the contact tracing and so forth, we had funding for that. And so it, it, these are some of the things that um, we had to make sure. And if you add those, just those two things up, 
to public right. health and small business, that's $1.2 billion. And so it, it really was a, a, a hard decision, but a decision that I think was responsible given the circumstances that we're in. Okay. Um, I know you're not federal government, right? But you did allude to the fact that, that maybe we're going to have further assistance from the federal government. What do you see that looking like? Maybe for our businesses, maybe for our, our consti your constitu constituents, our patrons? Absolutely. Well, first, I just wanted to say that I work incredibly well with my three members of Congress, Congresswoman Jan Schakowsky, Congressman Mike Quigley, Congressman uh, Brad Schneider. Uh, they're, they're really uh, working hard on our behalf in, in Washington, D.C. And, you know, they, they I, you know, talk to them regularly. They're, they're making sure that our, our voices are being heard. And I'll, I'll start also by saying we have to make sure people understand that there is still federal assistance available from the packages that were passed, from the CARES Act and the Cures Act. And uh, excuse me, I know that you all have been on the forefront of, of disseminating that information. I know, for example, the PPP application deadline was extended to August 8th. I'm sure folks, you all have, have, have circulated that information. Um, there's also a, a CARES Act funding that's gonna be starting to distribute, be dispersed to local municipalities, uh, essentially, if your count, if your municipality or locality is over five hundred thousand in population, then the counties kind of um, uh, are the ones were, were the ones to apply for that. So the county, Cook County, got four hundred and twenty nine million, and then they're going to disperse it to local uh, municipalities. Um, Great. But here, here's the reality of the situation: we need the federal government to step up again, and I, I say that especially on behalf of the residents in the state of Illinois. Why? Before the pandemic, we were third or fourth, we are third or fourth in dollars that go out to the federal government from the state of Illinois, our tax dollars. And we're 46 or 47th in receiving them back. We're a big state, 12.5 million people, uh, fifth largest economy in the United States. So we, we probably aren't gonna be able to be um, third or fourth in, in dollars that we receive back, but there is sure no way that we should be 46 or 47. Uh, and so we need the federal government to step up in this time. And I know that the U.S. House passed a, a package um, to help local state governments. But just keep in mind the connection, right? This is all we're all this is all connected. We've got local governments and the state government deferred sales tax payments, you know, uh, from from small businesses and other you know uh, fees and taxes because we knew that small businesses, you know, couldn't bear that burden right now. And so. Uh, that was the right thing to do to help our small businesses through this time. However, if we don't receive that revenue, then we can't provide the level of services that people are accustomed to. And uh, if you want to find out how fast, um, you know, uh, those services um, and, and how important those services are, you know, we'll, we'll, we won't. Yeah, if we don't get that assistance, we might we might find that out. And so, you know, it's a typical picking up your garbage and, and all those types yeah. of things. Um, that we rely on and, and may not think about every day, uh, and so um, we need to we need to continue to advocate and and support our our uh, House delegation and what they passed. Um, obviously, Senator Durbin and Senator Duckworth have been staunch allies uh, as well. Um, but, you know, it's really up to to Senator Mitch McConnell and President Trump to to make the next move. You know, the U.S. House passed the Heroes Act, so it's up to them next. But we got to be vigilant about advocating and supporting our our federal elected officials. Okay. Um, you've answered some of these already. Illinois numbers are changing daily. And while they were going down right now, they're trending back up a little bit. Just yesterday, Governor Pritzker announced a change from our four regions to 11 regions. Um, I don't want to talk about all 11 regions, right? I want to talk about uh, I want to talk about the one that Niles is in. I, are we yeah. are we Region 10? Um, it's the suburban Cook County, right? And if we have to move back because numbers go up, do you see it going all the way back to Phase Three, or is there a 3.5? And if those if our numbers track down, do you see it? being a four, do you see there being a 4.5 before we get to five? I think that's a great question. And first and foremost, we have to understand that and, and continue to uh, hold the administration accountable that decisions have to be based on science. 
and and public health uh, information and data. And so that's what uh, the governor has uh, said from the beginning. Quite frankly, that's what him and Dr. Ngaze Azike have done for, from the beginning. And so uh, we need to continue to keep that in mind, and we need to we need to hold them accountable to that to that uh, level. And and I will be as a legislator legislator. Uh, I uh, I certainly believe that the governor has done a a, jo a good job. You can see, look, you can see it. The numbers across the country, Texas has had to had to reverse course. Florida has re had to reverse yeah. course. California, Arizona, and and Alicia, I'm not a business owner, but from talking to business owners, the only thing worse than shutting down is having to do it twice. There you uh, go. Yeah. And so, uh, it, to me, that is something that we do not want to happen. And so, first again, I would say make sure we have to make sure that people understand and, and that we hold the administration accountable to make decisions based on science and public health information. Number one, number two, uh, I tell people this, you know, they ask me this question of, of what's going to happen. And I, and I tell them, look, it's dependent on you. It's dependent on me. It's dependent on our community. If people wear masks and they socially distance and they wash their hands, we're going to be going in the right direction. Like we are today. I truly believe that Illinoisans have answered the call. That's why we're in the, in the uh, position that we are in. And I will say, again, the governor's leadership has been great, but the reality is there have been other states that have implemented similar uh, orders and so forth, and they're still seeing some of the rise, rise in cases. And I truly believe that that's a difference in mentality. That's been a difference in how our communities have been, resp have been responding. And uh, I'm, I'm really proud of our communities for, for what they've done. Um, but we always can do better. So wearing a mask, socially distancing, um, and washing your hands, uh, that is what's going to keep us moving forward. If we don't do that, it's entirely possible that we were going to move back. And that's what the governor announced yesterday, right? He, in the last couple of days, he said, you know, if we have to go back, we're going to go back. And that's, again, he's basing his, his um, decision on science and, and public health. And so I am, I'm, I'm thrilled the fact that um, the, they expanded the number of regions. I think he heard from a lot of us the first time around, uh, you know, and I, and I was saying this earlier, um, no matter where you draw the lines, there's always going to be someone that has an issue with the lines, right? Right, um, exactly. It, that's just the nature of, of what we're dealing with here, but also just the nature of, you know, um, the, the constituencies that we have, right? We can't make 100% of everyone happy. Yeah. Um, it's not possible. And uh, I'm struggling to keep my wife happy, my constituent in my house happy, um, you know, during <laughs> this, uh, you know, with our 20 month old and everything going on. Uh, but the reality is the, the regions, I think, the re new regions responded to some of the outreach that us as legislators and you all as constituents have done to, to, to say, hey, we shouldn't really be bunched in with this group or that group. And so I think, as you alluded to, uh, the fact that suburban Cook is its own region and the city of Chicago is its own region, that's a that's a big deal. Um, and, and so I think we're going to continue to get more information. Obviously, the governor announced a new set of actions to combat a resurgence. Uh, if there is one, um, mitigation guidance that takes into account where we are in terms of testing, contact tracing, PPE, and hospital surge capacity. Um, it's important to note, and, and just for people to know, um, there's going to be a huge uh, effort to hire contact tracers over the next month, a couple months. Mm -hmm. so that, those are uh, jobs that are going to be available. Um, and going to be very helpful, right? Like that's, yeah. you've all heard, right? From Dr. Fauci on down, testing, contact tracing, uh, PPE, um, those are going to be the, that's, those are the, the ways that, those are the ways that we're going to be able to, um, you know, uh, mitigate and handle this, handle this virus. And so, you know, I, I would just say there is absolutely a, a possibility that we would have to change regulations for bars and restaurants and hospitals and gatherings, retail, salons, and so forth. I No one wants to do that. Like, no <laughs> one wants to do that. However, if we head in back in the wrong direction, um, you know, we're, we're, we're um, you know, we're, we're going to be forced to follow the science and, and the data. Uh, and so that's, as we move forward and our positive our positivity rate fluctuates, um, you know, I think those what he laid out yesterday is going to be our guiding our guiding force. 
So let's let's say we wear our masks and we we start to tamp things down and our numbers are going down. Do we see something in between four and five? So I'm going to be very uh, self-serving here. Uh, chamber events generally draw more than 50 people. So I don't get to have any events until we've got a vaccine is kind of what we're looking at right now. Do we see something in between that? I think we can. Um, look, I, I, um, I, I have tremendous respect for Dr. Ngaize Azike and, 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 and her, um, you know, guidance. And I think, you know, I, I'd like to defer to her, but just in what I've read and the conversations that I've had, I think that we're going to have to continue to adapt um, to um, the, the new normal and the new situations. And so I do think that if people continue to, to employ these safety measures, um, you know, we will um, be able to do a hybrid uh, of, of uh, and, and you've seen that, right? You've seen that with even with the new the the the, the executive orders, the stay at home orders from March to April when when they were extended, right. there were changes, right? There were there right. were changes, right. uh, whether it was golfing or boating or whatever the case may be. Uh, you know, it seems like a lifetime ago, but um, there were changes that were made, uh, and I think that that again is 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 them as the administration being responsive to. Um, hearing from constituents, you know, I'll say that um, when when I heard that golfing, boating, and then I think it was the um, gardening uh, or the garden centers. Yes, the garden um, centers. I mean, if you would have told me that those were three changes that were would have been made between executive orders, um, I, I wouldn't have believed you. You know, but it was a result of people making their voice heard, calling the governor, calling my office, and saying, "Look, we want this. We need this." You know, and I think. That's what's going to have to happen again. You know, if, if we go backwards, we need to identify uh, in terms of the, the case, the positive cases and so forth. We need to identify those 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 changes that we can make to not fully go backwards, but, you know, continue to operate as much as we can. So I do think there's a lot of room for that. Um, <laughs> I'm hopeful that we don't go backwards at all. Uh, you know, I think, you know, and, and the biggest question in my mind, honestly, Alicia, is I do think that. If we send the message out to businesses and our and our workers and others that say, look, if you want to work, if you want to keep your business open, you got to do these things. I do believe that they will do it uh, because they've, they've already seen the alternative. Um, and so that's less a question for me about what happens next. And more, you know, the biggest question, I think, the, I don't know, if, I don't know what amount, a dollar you want to put to it, the million dollar question Um is, is in terms of reopening the schools. And that's a whole other issue. That's my next question. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, that's the biggest thing right now in everybody's minds, right? How do we get the kids back to school? And I'll tell you, this is this is one argument that I can absolutely see every side of, right? Those, those kids are going to learn best in in-person learning. And our businesses need those kids to go back to school so their employees don't have to worry about childcare. However, if that makes the virus worse and then we have to, you know, it's so tell me what you're hearing about it. Absolutely. So first uh, th there is no right answer here. Let's just be clear. Um, th there, there is such a struggle here, right? Um, you know, you, you're, you're, you laid it quickly. You, you have people that, that need to uh, have kids, that um, needs st stability in terms of childcare so that they can work. Uh, right. You also have laid out the fact that, you know, if we go back to school in person, um, the risk of uh, not being able, not, not having our kids to be able to wear a mask for eight hours a day, the practicality of that, not uh, being able to socially distance um, and, and not to be able to contain the, um, the spread of the virus, uh, you know, and so forth. Uh, let me let me also start by saying I, I could not be prouder of the way that our superintendents, our principals, our teachers, school staff um, have handled this situation. It's it's been and our students, obviously, and parents. It's been incredibly hard. You know, one of the most heartbreaking parts of this is our seniors, right? Our seniors that were not able to graduate and celebrate the way that they should have been, and. Uh, it's it just, it's heartbreaking. You know, when I, when I, when I, I did a few 
um, letters and a few uh, videos, for, you know, for some some students in schools. Uh, it, it's it's it, it just leaves a bad taste in your mouth. But I, I will say, I got to tell you, the people, the students that I talked to, I mean, they were they handled it with such poise, such. Uh, I'm I'm just you know, I, and then it just goes back for me. I'm so hopeful for our, our next generation, and so I'm I'm really proud of of those kids. Yeah, um, our kids are but, resilient. They really are, you know, and 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 they're more resilient than a lot of us. And so it's it's it really showed um, over the last uh, four months. Um, but look, I'm proud of them. I'm proud of our parents. I'm proud of all of the school um, staff and, and and teachers and 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 superintendents and so forth, principals. Um, the way they've handled remote learning and and the and the end of the school year has been great. I, I sp actually spoke with all the suburban superintendents. The days are running together, either yesterday or the day before, and. You know it, and I have a call with uh, all the Chicago Public Schools uh, principals uh, next week because I represent both the city and suburbs. Right. And um, we talked about how remote learning went last last uh, for over the last couple months, and then you know in person learning. And look, the reality is there's just a lot of um, uh, answers um, still that are that have not that, a lot of questions that have not been answered. And so I would say this: if we are headed towards in person lear learning. We need much better guidance from the Illinois State Board of Election, or Education and um, the administration, and including the Illinois Department of Public Health. Why? Because schools, um, they're just by definition a different situation. You know, we have six, seven, eight year olds that, you know, we can only expect so much, you know, in terms of wearing a mask and socially distancing and so forth. Um, it, it can be very hard. Number one, number two, uh, we need we don't have the physical space, right? We have to figure out the physical space. How are we going to, in a classroom of thirty people, thirty kids, forty kids, maintain six feet? Um, that's a question mark, right? Yeah. Number three, PPE. You know, so if we're going to, you know, just like we're talking about PPE for hospitals, community organizations, small businesses, so forth, PPE is needed, hand sanitizer masks, you know, so many different types of PPE is needed for the, for the schools. Uh, and so you have hundreds and hundreds of students, you have, um, you know, uh, uh, hundred, you know, or so faculty maybe in, in different school districts. And, and so that's going to require a certain amount of PPE. So those are some of the concerns that I've heard. If we're going to go in the direction, again, if we're going to go in the direction of in-person learning, we have to figure those, those, those items out and much more. Um, yeah. And, and that's the bottom line. And we cannot go in that direction unless we figure that out. I'm hopeful we can figure figure uh, something out. Um, you know, the reality is that, that it's not only childcare for workers, but it's also you have people on free or reduced lunch. So making sure our kids get healthy meals um, every day. Um, you know, there, there's so many different factors there. So the, the honest and, and short answer is, um, we don't know yet. At the same time, I think that we're starting to identify from my conversations with superintendents and, and, and going to be next year, next week with principals. We're going to identify the things that we do need in order to uh, in order to do in-person learning. And, and, and I believe and I'm going to be pushing for unless we get those things, it's not safe to reopen. You know, um, and Alicia, the last thing I'll say on this front is. I think it depends, you know, we're, we're at July 16th, right? Yeah. I would say the next four weeks are going to determine what really happens. Critical. If we start to see an increase in positive cases, um, you know, I think there's going to be, um, you know, a, a more um, uh, safe and, and, and approach of, for remote learning. Uh, if we don't, then I do think that, you know, We'll see uh, something uh, along the lines more of in-person or a hybrid is what I've been hearing too. A hybrid yeah. of two yeah. days in, two days out or so forth. So yeah. um, I, I would say, again, this is an issue that parents and others need to reach out to the elected officials with and reach out to the governor on so we can hear your thoughts. Because on the one hand, the, the polling shows the governor has 70 percent approval rating on how he's handling the pandemic. On the other hand, we we see you know from talking to my superintendents um, and others, most most parents want their kids to go back to school. So you know you, we can't have it both ways. We have to right. you right. know we have to make it clear what what we want to happen. So 
Uh, yeah, all of that is spot on. So in the coming weeks and month, as, as everything continues to unfold, where can residents find the most useful information? What platforms are you using to disseminate information? Well, I, I absolutely uh, thank you for that question. It's, it's always a struggle of mine. People ask me what my biggest challenge is, and I tell them I represent 217,000 people, and I don't know what they're all thinking, you know? And so it, it's it's a challenge. But I would say, uh, first and foremost, please go to our website, www.senatorram, Senator R-A-M as in Mary, dot com. Please sign up for our newsletter. We send them out every week or every other week, depending on, you know, the type of updates that need to happen. Um, we have a link that we can send you, Alicia, uh, to, to, to send to folks that has a full list of resources. It's like 60 pages, but it really it has a table of contents. Don't worry. Uh, it, it, but it really um, outlines all the different types of assistance that's available and when it's available and how you access it and so forth. Uh, and so um, it's important for people to know that as well. Excuse me, as well. Um, and then I would also say, um, please um, go to our Facebook page and follow our Facebook page. We post maybe six or seven times a day uh, as to the different updates that are taking place. So I think these three platforms, or sorry, two platforms, and then the link of our resources is the best way to follow us. Obviously, you can um, contact our office as well. And um, what is the best way to reach your office? So the best way to reach, well, I, I say for folks, the best way is however you think is the best way. Um, so we have our, a phone number. Um, you can call our office, 872-208-5188. Um, we have our email address, info at Senator Ram, R-A-M as in Mary, dot com. Um, we also uh, obviously have our Facebook page. You can message us there. Um, and um, the website has a contact us page as well. And then lastly, we just... Um, uh, and we have a Twitter account as well. But lastly, we just added a text feature about, I guess, a week ago. And uh, it, the you can text us at 224-592-5819. So we know people are busy. We know people are stressed. Reach out to tell us. Me the tech, tell me the text number again. Yeah, absolutely. The text number is 224-592-5819. And so, again, people, uh, we know you're stressed. We know you're busy. Um, so reach out to us in whatever platform uh, is most helpful to you. Um, you know, and, and like I said, you might get a robocall from us. You might get a text message. Um, you know, you can always – we've had a couple of people call us and verify uh, that it wasn't a scam, and that's okay. You, sh you know, you should yeah. do that if you're comfortable, if you, if you need to do that. Um, but we're, we're here to help, and um, uh, most importantly um, – it's been a collaboration, um, and I and I again appreciate the collaboration that we've had with you all. Excellent, Senator. Thank you so much for giving us your time this morning. We know it's valuable. Um, you have a great day, and we will talk to you again soon. Thank you so much, Alicia and Chase. Bye bye. Bye. -bye.